Um, all right, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming out and welcome to Getting on the Level with Levels. Uh, my name is Audrey Martovich and I do member support here at PRX. Um, we're very excited to be co-hosting this webinar with Beck Feldhouse Adams, the talent manager at AIR, um, and all the folks at AIR. So thank you, Beck. Yeah, and we're thrilled you, to be Air. here. Um, awesome. So before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about how we will structure the hour. Um, first, we're going to hear from our presenters who will speak for about 20 minutes each. Then we'll plan for about a 15-minute um, Q&A at the end, so please um, you know, think of some wonderful questions. We'll be taking those throughout the webinar in the chat box on the side of your controls. Hopefully you all see that. Um, so make sure to send your questions along as you have them, and we'll flag them for the end. You can also tweet your comments or questions with, um, Beck mentioned this earlier, but the hashtag is hashtag loudness2014. So we will be on the lookout for those on Twitter. And um, like I mentioned, like I mentioned, um, the webinar is also being recorded, so we'll share that link afterward. Um, wonderful. We're so excited about the presentations for, that we have for you today. Um, I think we should really just get right down to it. So first up, we have Adam Ragusia. Adam is a journalist in residence and visiting assistant professor of journalism at Mercer University's Center for Collaborative Journalism. Formerly, Adam served as Macon Bureau Chief for Georgia Public Broadcasting. Um, and I just want to say that Adam really prompted this webinar today with his article in Current that I am hoping you all read. It was uh, titled, Why You're Doing Audio Levels Wrong and Why It Really Does Matter. So thanks, Adam, for starting the conversation. And we're really excited to hear more from you about that. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. We have Rob. He will be doing the second presentation with us. Uh, Rob Byers is the Technical Coordinator of Music at Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media and a self-proclaimed loudness advocate. Rob will go over what loudness is and how we can measure it, and then provide some mixing tips for everybody. So let's get started. So remember, you can um, chat your questions or tweet hashtag loudness2014 or hashtag levels2014. First up, Adam Ragusea. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Really uh, honored to be doing this. I think before we dive into uh, the subject matter at hand, it's probably good if we remind ourselves what sound is. So have a look here at uh, this uh, first slide. Uh, sound is just the movement of air molecules from a sound source, like our speaker over here, uh, to your ear. Uh, we all know that, right? Uh, but sound proceeds in waves, uh, waves of compressed air molecules and rarefied air molecules, basically high pressure and low pressure. And these waves lap up against your eardrum the way that waves in the ocean lap up against the beach. Think about it. You've got uh, an internal air pressure in your skull there. And uh, if the air pressure on the outside of your eardrum is equal to the air pressure on the inside of your eardrum, your eardrum will, main, will remain totally static. It won't move and you will hear silence. But if uh, you have an, an elevated level of air pressure on the outside of your eardrum, that's going to push your eardrum in. Uh, conversely, if you have a rarefied air pressure on the outside of your eardrum, it's going to pull on your eardrum. And thus, these waves of compressed and rarefied air molecules bumping up against your eardrum alternatingly push and pull on your eardrum. And that movement in and out of your eardrum is uh, interpreted by your brain as sound. And the slower that those waves lap up against your eardrum, the lower the frequency. And the faster those waves lap up against your eardrum, the higher the frequency. And we see below uh, here uh, a demonstration of how this looks on a computer. You'll see a line down the middle that is called the mean position. Uh, sometimes people call it uh, the uh, equilibrium line. Basically, uh, sound that comes in on that line is not sound at all. That is equal air pressure, uh, nothing going on. Uh, positive air pressure is indicated on uh, this line 
on the uh, north side of that uh, equilibrium line, and then negative air pressure is indicated down here in the negative phase of the wave. Uh, so the lowest point of the uh, uh, the quietest point of this sound is right here on the middle line. It's not at the bottom. Right here in the middle line is equilibrium. Um, the loudest point of the positive phase of the wave and the loudest point of the negative phase of the wave are just as loud. A push is just as good of a pull in terms of stimulating your eardrum to uh, send a sound signal to your brain. Okay, everybody got that? Now just pocket that information away for a second and let's think about how we represent sounds digitally. Right here we have uh, a, a real sound indicated by that red line. That's a natural sound. And then uh, the digital representation of that sound is indicated by the gray. Um, if you think about it, all sound is is just a sequence of loudnesses. And yes, I'm using loudness in the non-scientific sense of the word right now. Uh, nerds, keep your corduroys on. We're going to get to the nerdy definition of loudness later on, but right now uh, just we're using loudness in the colloquial sense. Sound is just a sequence of loudnesses. Sound being uh, air molecules being moved up against your eardrum, and so that's all that it is represented digitally. Basically, uh, there's uh, the computer sort of spits out a number that tells the speaker move this number of air molecules now. I'm oversimplifying greatly, but that's essentially how it works. So this is a, a really simple digital representation of sound where uh, the, all the possibilities of loudness are broken down into a few numerical steps. Um, this would be using a spectrum of 0 to 15, 16 numbers to, uh, to represent any given moment of loudness, with 7 being silent. 7 is the middle, that's the equilibrium, and then 15 or 0 being the loudest possible sound that this digital system can replicate. And every number in between is just a, a relative stop of loudness along that spectrum. Now this right here is a really, really low resolution representation of, of sound. This would be like having a, a computer monitor that uh, only has 16 pixels on it. You're not going to get a very accurate representation <laughs> of your uh, natural image that way. Uh, likewise, same thing with sound. Real uh, digital representations of sound use tens of thousands of numbers along that spectrum to indicate the relative loudness of any given instant of sound. But ultimately, uh, you know, a number of 30,000 along that that spectrum uh, would still be just as loud as a number of 15 here on this spectrum. It's basically you've got a set of numbers, the highest of which is the loudest possible sound, and then the middle of which is the quietest possible sound, i.e. zero. Okay, everybody got that? Don't worry if you're a little bit fuzzy. Uh, just pocket that information away and let's uh, move on to some real world examples. Okay, we're going to look here at uh, a story. This is a feature story that was produced uh, by my former Georgia Public Broadcasting colleague, Gene Bonner. Really nice story. Uh, here we are looking at the waveform in Adobe Audition. And uh, you can see that this has a problem that uh, most, I reckon to say, audio produced for radio has, um, which is that it's got uh, this, uh, well, let's back up a second. What, what Jean did to this is what most people, I think, are trained to do. She normalized her feature story at the end. Oh, there's a hilarious joke in the chat window right now. Shouldn't allow to be 11, that's one more than 10. Spinal Tap reference. Go watch it after you're done uh, with this. Okay, so Jean uh, took her feature story, she mixed it, she did a really nice job reporting it, and then she normalized it, which means she basically told the computer, make this file as loud as it can be relative to that numerical spectrum which is representing my natural sound. Okay, um, That's great, except that we've got this unrepresentative little peak here. Uh, we call this a transient, basically one little highly unrepresentative moment of extreme loudness that's throwing off the whole normalization process. 
um, you know, because uh, the, this thing has been maximized, but only relative to its loudest point, and its loudest point has nothing to do with the rest of it. Um, I can tell you that just looking at the relatively low level of the rest of this file, that this file, if played on the radio at Georgia Public Broadcasting, would probably be quieter uh, than most of the other stuff that they would be playing through their board, and that would be a bad thing. So let's just sort of listen to how that little transient moment sounds. ...back none, regardless of her gender. But Baird admits it's no small matter that none is a woman. I mean, I've been waiting for this for 40 years. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a little laugh, right? No big deal, just a little laugh. Uh, so we need to basically uh, duck that little moment down. And I find that the easiest and certainly the fastest way to deal with transients um, is using what we call compression. Compression is computer processing that basically does what you do yourself with your volume knob on your car stereo when you're driving down the road listening to the radio. When uh, something really loud happens that's too loud for you, you grab your knob and you pull it down a little bit. And then when something really quiet happens, you grab that knob and you turn it up, right? It's computer processing that just does that automatically. And the simplest form of compression is uh, what we call limiting. Uh, ooh, I'm being told that we need to test the videos, that you guys were not hearing the sound that we just played. Okay, um, let's go ahead and try that again for you. Yeah, um... Oh, so some people heard it. Oh, oh, right. Okay, great. So yeah, okay. if you're dialed in by the phone, you're going to need to hear it through your computer, it seems. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, that is totally true. Okay. Um, so, yes, turn on the speakers on your computer or plug in headphones on your computer. Right now, I've got uh, one earbud from my computer in my left ear, and my right ear is on the phone receiver. And they heard it in France. That's hilarious. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Where were we? Okay. So the simplest form of compression is called limiting. All limiting does is it basically sort of ducks down the volume in anticipation of those really loud moments. It doesn't worry about the, the quiet moments. It just ducks down the volume relative to uh, those uh, really loud moments. And it's the, the, the kind of compression that is the simplest to use, um, and it's the one that I definitely recommend. Just about any kind of digital audio editor that you have has some kind of limiter in it. And here is uh, Adobe Audition's limiter. They call it a hard limiter. I don't really know why. Um, no limiting won't cause clipping. Oh, I shouldn't be answering questions yet. We're going to answer questions at the end. Sorry. Okay. Um, so this right here is a limiter. Um, it has uh, four little parameters that you can adjust. You really only need to worry about the uh, top two. Limit maximum amplitude is basically what's the loudest sound that I should allow. We're going to leave that unchanged right now. We're going to leave it at zero, which in decibels full scale is zero. Uh, zero is the loudest thing. Anything sub-zero is not as loud as the loudest thing. Uh, and then you've got the input boost. This is the main one you need to be concerned about. Basically, this is uh, how much juice are you giving this sound? Uh, how it's gonna, you're going to set it to, say, 3 decibels, and it's going to raise the whole level of your whole sound by 3 decibels. Look ahead time and release time are things that you probably don't need to worry about. Basically, it's how fast should I duck down the volume, that volume knob, in anticipation of this loud sign, and how fast should I pull it back up after the loud sound is over. Uh, it's, that's like fifth level black belt stuff. You don't need to worry about it uh, at this stage in your life. Uh, I almost never touch those. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and apply a limiter to Gene's story. We're just going to do exactly uh, what that, uh, that image right there is showing you. We're going to go up to the effects menu. We're going to go into amplitude and compression, hard limiting. And we're going to give it three decibels of volume boost. Let's listen. That none is a woman. I mean, I've been waiting for this for 40 years. <laughs> It remains to be seen if he... Okay, so you guys all should have heard that. And uh, what we're looking at now is a waveform that's a little bit beefier, a little bit more even. Um, and I did not hear that the effect of that compression sounded just fine. Um, no, there is no clipping to answer a question. Um, yes, you just heard the snippet. Uh, that's, you should only have heard a snippet just now. Okay. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, so 
uh, to, do, to, do, to do, what was I saying, clipping. Yeah, there's no clipping. Clipping, digital clipping basically means the system is getting more audio than it can handle, and every single individual sample, every single instance of loudness is just represented by the highest possible number. So in our earlier example, in a spectrum of 16, um, the highest digit would simply be recorded, and you would get uh, a nasty ugly sound. What uh, limiting does is it actually just kind of pulls down the volume knob, so the whole sort of setting goes down for a moment. But the detail of that instant of sound is still perfectly represented. Alrighty. Um, now the problem with what we've just done is that uh, we've left no headroom. Um, the loudest moment in this sound still goes all the way to zero, all the way to the loudest you can possibly go. That's not good generally in the world of radio, uh, where we like to leave ourselves a little bit of room for error. Because remember, uh, your sound might be perfect and beautiful as it is, but then you file it to someone who puts it in a computer and does some stuff to it, who then sends it to another person who puts it in a computer and does some stuff to it, then it gets played through a board. And these are all opportunities for potentially the level to be boosted in one way or another. Uh, and if you're already at the maximum level of loudness or, or amplitude in this case, um, you could get clipping. So you always want to leave yourself a little room for error. I think probably the industry standard is to leave yourself three decibels of headroom so that your loudest sound in your sound file is minus three in decibels full scale. Um, so the easy way to do that with a limiter is to uh, just go up to that limiting patch again and uh, grab that maximum amplitude thing and say limit max amplitude to minus three. Hey, and Adam. Yes? Hi. Sorry, this is Audrey. Um, we're not seeing the video. Are you playing a new video? Because we're not seeing it. Yes, I am. Well, we, we're still in our last video, but we're, I've been pausing it and stopping it and playing it. Oh, okay. On slide seven, right? We are on slide seven, yes. Okay, great. Just checking in. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. So what I've done here is I've uh, I have limited the max amplitude to minus three dB, and what that has done is it has compressed several of the little peaks along the the course of this here feature story. Uh, let's go ahead and listen to how that little laugh sounds again. Is a woman. I mean, I've been waiting for this for forty years. <laughs> It remains to be seen if All right. these women uh, I heard no sort of uh, audio artifact that sounded totally natural to me still. That laugh was still nice and punchy and popped out. And now we've got a nice, even, full level over the course of this story. Yay. All righty. Uh, let's move on and look at another example. This is a, a piece of phone tape. And as we all know, uh, a phone tape notoriously has really uneven levels. You'll get lots and lots of transients, little itty bitty blips that are not representative of the loudness of the rest of the file or the quote. Um, so I really, almost every piece of phone tape that I gather, I run through a limiter. Um, it's the easiest and fastest way to just kind of get everything nice and even. So let's listen to this piece of phone tape right now. Relative to even schools within the school district or say my school district compared to other school districts around. Okay, so you got this like really glaring a few a couple of transients right here that uh, are way louder than the rest of this quote which all sort of happens down in this much 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 quieter range. So let's go ahead and do what we did before. We're going to go on up to the effects menu, go to amplitude and compression, hard limiter, and we're going to give it, uh, let's say, 10 dB of boost of juice. What their growth is relative to even schools within the school district or, say, my school district compared to other school districts surrounding. All right, very nice. Nice, even level. We've, uh, we've uh, leveled off those transients. It's nice and full, nice and even. Now, if this whole sound was now too loud relative to the other elements in your story, you could always bring it down again. But just that limiting step has gone ahead and made this nice and even for us. Uh, now, Oh, someone just said that they heard some clipping. Uh, the clipping was from the original sound source. Uh, I think it was analog clipped at the time of recording. That wasn't us just now. Limiting will never result in clipping. Uh, that's what limiting does. Uh, now, uh, nothing comes in this life for free. Uh, limiting has a consequence. Um, ooh, damn. Uh, 
Sorry, guys. I just uh, I got out of order in my presentation here for a second. Uh, Going to go ahead and uh, move on. Uh, but describe for you the fact that uh, nothing in this life comes for free. Um, compression has an audible effect. Uh, and if you're wondering what that is, just listen to commercial radio. Um, the adjective that people sort of use to describe highly compressed sound is uh, sometimes punchy. Sometimes people will say that it sounds sort of tight or claustrophobic. It doesn't sound open or natural. Um, try, once you're messing around with a limiter in whatever digital audio software you're using, compressing something a ton, like give it, you know, 30 decibels of boost and listen to what it sounds, and it will create a sound that will be very familiar to you, that will sound sort of commercial, like, like local TV news or commercial radio like Rush Limbaugh. It, uh, it, it's not necessarily bad or good. It just is, and it's something that you need to be aware of. But the kind of compression that you would apply to just kind of level off those transients is going to be inaudible to you know, all but the Rob Byers's of the world. All right, let's move on to another example where I think compression probably is going to fail us. Here's a, here's a piece of sound that uh, I filed to NPR um, as part of a story that I did for them. And anyone who's ever filed to NPR before knows that you don't send them a mixed story. You send them what you call an elements file, basically just uh, all of your sound bites and your acts and your tracks all laid out in sequence and then they go ahead and mix it for you. And it's always a really scary process for me because I just don't know how it's going to be mixed. Um, and I never know um, how much to trust <laughs> the uh, producer at NPR who might not necessarily have a lot of time to, to really futz with my stuff. Here's a, a piece of sound that I sent them. A lot of things that we need to do to make things right in this country that, that are not getting talked about because we're talking about uh, what's going on in, in another Okay, what's the problem with this? Well, the first half of it is way louder than the second half. Uh, and it's not having to do with any technical problem with the audio. That's just how it occurred in nature. That's how this congressman spoke. He did what people do. He trailed off at the end of a sentence. Um, and I was sort of hoping that NPR would go ahead and level this out a little bit, um, even out that level, and they uh, didn't. And uh, the consequence of that was that I think probably a lot of people who listened to that story really missed those last few words. I mean, we all heard them right now because we're sitting here listening to it in isolation uh, with headphones. And we heard every word, but we all know that people don't listen to radio like that in the real world. Um, they are listening while they're doing dishes, or they're listening while they're driving in a car. They're listening in noisy environments, and the radio is competing for attention. So one of the things that I do uh, as I'm mixing a lot of the time is I've got this... Uh, sound file that you can see right here um, in this multi-track session. I've got that quote from that congressman up top. And then below it, I've got this sound file of car noise that I just recorded. I just recorded you know, myself driving down the highway at 65 miles per hour. And I just keep that around, and sometimes I'll throw it into a multi-track session with a piece of sound that I'm working with, and I will see how that sound will be heard as someone is driving down the highway. Let's do that right now. A lot of things that we need to do to make things right in this country that, that are not getting talked about because we're talking about uh, what's going on in another country. Okay, totally lost it. Totally lost him. We lost his words at the end. Uh, he got quieter than the car is loud at the very end. That is bad. We need to uh, even out the level of that bite so that it will be uh, more likely to be heard in its entirety in the natural world. All right. So we can do that using a limiter like we did just before. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to click into that sound, go up and use the limiter in Adobe Audition again. Going to give the whole thing a 10 dB boost. There are a lot of things that we need to do to make things right in this country that, that are not getting talked about because we're talking about uh, what's going on in, in another country. Okay. So it's nice and even now, but remember uh, a few minutes ago I was talking about that audible effect of compression, how it sort of has a sound? I totally heard of that on the whole first half of this quote. He sounded like he was on commercial radio there for the first uh, four or five seconds, and that is bad. I don't like that. It did not sound natural. If I was in a rush, if I had 15 seconds to get this clip to air, which 
all of us know are often in that situation, then this would be fine. But um, if you have a little bit of time, there really is a better way to re-level something like this. Compression is really good for leveling off those transients, those really, really quick bits of loud stuff. But for things where there are substantial chunks of time that are uh, of, a, of a problematic loudness, then I really recommend doing what I would just call manual compression, using fader automation inside your digital audio program to manually do what the compressor would do, but with a little bit more artistry, a little, artistry, a little bit more finesse. That would involve going in, in an Adobe Audition, you would do this in your multi-track view. You would take a look at uh, your clip, and you would see that there is a yellow line that is your fader automation line. You can click on it, thus creating data points that can be dragged around. Uh, I'll go ahead and do this for you right here. I'm just clicking and dragging, clicking and dragging, making the fader go higher toward the end of this sound to compensate for the fact that congressmen... There are a lot of things that we need to do to make things right in this country that, that are not getting talked about because we're talking about uh, what's going on in, in another country. All right, everybody hear that? We just heard the volume boost up a little bit toward the end. It was much more natural. Let's hear that sound in the car. There are a lot of things that we need to do to make things right in this country. That, that are not getting talked about because we're talking about uh, what's going on in, in another country. All right. I heard every word of that relative to that noisy car. So success. Uh, mission succeeded. Um, I now, uh, before I file to NPR, and I don't know if they like that I do this, but... Uh, too bad. Um, I do this kind of leveling on every single cut that I send them because I just assume that they don't have the time to do it. Um, I don't necessarily advocate that. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Rob Byers, who is a much more diplomatic person than I am, is going to tell you that you really just need to communicate with whatever show you're filing to um, about what they want and what their standards are. Um, I have found that uh, I really just like to give them kind of an idiot-proof file that uh, can't be screwed up. But that's because I'm not very good at playing well with others. So those are some really quick, highly practical, real-world techniques for uh, dealing with levels. But bear in mind that I am not an engineer. I'm just a, a journeyman public radio reporter. Um, and uh, people who actually do this stuff for a living uh, think about it in much more sophisticated ways. And uh, with that, I give you a much more sophisticated person, Rob Byers of American Public Media. Thank you, Adam. Um, first, before we get started here, I'm going to ask that uh, Audrey or Beck please make me presenter again. I got kicked off a little while ago, uh, so I just logged back in and I can't control any slides at the moment. Um, while I'm waiting for that, uh, I'll let you folks know that I'm going to move kind of quickly here. There's a lot to cover, um, but this is being recorded, as you know, so you can always come back for reference. And also, what I'm going to talk about is geared towards producers. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names in this list. Uh, of, uh, of participants, and a lot of engineers in there. Um, so this, my, uh, my focus here is going to be towards uh, producers. And I'm just getting logged back in here. Just a moment, please. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I am not here to talk about the the uh, heavy metal band from the late 80s, Loudness, although I kind of wish that it was because they're pretty awesome looking. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a new slash old technology called Loudness Measurement. Um, it's been around in Europe since about 2006, and uh, US, the U.S. television industry started using it about four years ago with the CALM Act. Uh, the CALM Act was passed by Congress uh, to address differences in level uh, between television features and uh, television ads. So, you know, it's one in the morning, you're watching Gilligan's Island reruns, and the head-on applied directly to forehead commercial comes on and knocks you out of your chair, right? So they wanted to address that issue. Um, you may already be using loudness uh, now uh, if you use Spotify or iTunes. Um, this is something that you can turn on in preferences. Uh, in iTunes, it's called Soundcheck. And in Spotify, it's set the same volume level for all tracks. And that's essentially what it does. Uh, those two programs will analyze the audio that you're going to play back, and they will mm -hmm. say, okay, uh, I'm going to use loudness technology and adjust the playback uh, of these audio tracks so that you get a consistent experience. Now, iTunes Radio 
is actually using it now, so iTunes Radio is the streaming service. Mm -hmm. It uses it as well, and it's automatic, and you can't turn it off. And that's kind of an interesting sign. Um, iTunes has kind of been a leader in this in this field, and that's a really interesting sign. I think it's pointing uh, uh, the direction the things are going. Um, Pandora doesn't use loudness technology, and you can really tell when you're taking a listen. So I told you to wait for it. There it is. Uh, there's the Spinal Tap reference. The reason I'm here uh, is because uh, Minnesota Public Radio and APM, those are my companies, um, have been using loudness with great success for about the past year. And I'm also on a working group with the PRSS, uh, National Public Radio, and APM, and we're collaborating to, prove, uh, to improve level consistency uh, in the public radio sphere. And right now, all signs point to our recommendation to shifting the system towards loudness measurement. And the great thing about it is you don't have to wait for us. You can start using it too. So what is loudness? Well, loudness is measuring audio based on perception. Um, not based on how this little guy hears, but how the human ear hears. Um, mm -hmm. It's taking into account frequency and duration in a way that no other meters have done before. So this is as technical as I'm going to get, I promise. Um, the Fletcher-Munson curve there on the left uh, is basically saying humans don't perceive all frequencies equally. So we're less sensitive to base frequencies and we're more sensitive to the frequencies, say, that have to do with speech, right? So the graph on the right, that's the loudness filter mm -hmm. that loudest technology uses. That's basically just an upside-down Fletcher-Munson curve. So it's asking the question, if I were a human ear, how would I respond to this audio that I'm hearing or that's coming through me, mm -hmm. through the meter right now? So that's frequency. There's also uh, the second component is duration. And if a sound sticks around for a while, it may actually be perceived louder to your ear. So the loudness meters are taking to both of those things into account. Now, how is this different from what we've been using, uh, peak and VU meters? Those meters measure electrical level. Peak meters only measure the digital peaks uh, of the waveform. Um, VU meters, they measure an electrical average. And they really have nothing to do with the way we perceive sound. Um, they can get close in some ways, but when it really comes down to it, they're not taking into account perception. So what's wrong with that? Well, right off the bat, two things can have the same level, but have a different loudness. Another way to phrase that is uh, audio can look right on the meter, but sound wrong and vice versa. And we've all experienced this if we've worked with phoner tape at any point. Mm -hmm. um, at, as Adam's example showed us earlier, phoner tape can, can be rather transient. It can look really spiky in the waveform. And the meter will be saying, no, 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 that's too hot, that's too hot. But our ear is telling us, actually, it's just right. It's lining up with uh, the studio voice really nicely. So audio can look right, but sound wrong. And I'm going to prove that to you. Um, I've got an example here. Um, that will play a 100 hertz tone followed by a 5 kilohertz tone, so much higher. They're both mm -hmm. going to be at the same level, um, but you're going to notice that the meter doesn't change. Um, and a side note, keep your finger on the volume knob, uh, especially if you've got headphones on. When it hits 5K at about 5 seconds, um, it gets a little loud, so I just want, want you to be aware of that. So 5 seconds of 100 hertz, 5 seconds of 5K. Mm -hmm. There's your 100, 5K. And that's sounding a little distorted on my end. It might be on yours as too. Um, but the whole point there is the electrical level uh, didn't change. In fact, the waveforms and Pro Tools look exactly the same. But obviously, to our ears, they sound different. They're perceived differently. So another issue with peak metering is that we have an interpretation issue. Uh, if I tell you to mix voice to neg 15 dBFS or to neg 15 on a peak meter, what does that mean? Does that mean that the voice should hit neg 15 all the time? Should you make the voice go through neg 15, maybe up to neg 10? Or should you just kind of tickle neg 15 and be more between neg 20 and neg 15? So um, specifications based around uh, peak metering can have, they can be open to interpretation. You and I would both take a different approach uh, to that spec if given it.
Okay, so does this mean that we're going to throw out peak metering or that we should throw out peak metering? No, um, definitely not. They still have their place. Um, we have to know electrical level to avoid overs, right? We have to know if we're going to hit zero or not, if we're going to clip or not. And that's really important when you're doing field recording. You're out in the field with your Marantz, you need to be able to quickly look down in your hand and see, I have enough headroom. That laughter that I just recorded did not clip, and you need to know that immediately. Um, also, engineers need it for calibrating equipment, so peak metering isn't going anywhere. But there is a better way to mix, and that's with loudness meters. Um, so what does a loudness meter look like? Well, they can look like this. There's a lot going on here. And this can be really confusing. I'm, I'm seeing three large numbers in front of me and a bunch of meters and a bunch of options. This is the Waze uh, WL, WLM meter. And this is something that an audio engineer uh, or technical staff might use. Um, but they can also look like this. And this is just giving, giving me back one number. I'm told a target, so maybe my target is zero. And as long as this meter is reading back zero, I know uh, that I'm, I'm hitting target and that I'm accurate, and there's no interpretation issue in, involved. Um, loudness can also be represented by a bar graph mm -hmm. meter, and some of us are more familiar or more comfortable with that, and that, that's just another way to represent the information. So loudness is represented in loudness units full scale, loudness units relative to full scale, or LUFs. Um, and when you see LUFs, all that means is that the measurement has been done taking into account perception. So that's a measurement that uses that upside down Fletcher Munson curve for frequency and mm -hmm. is also taking into account duration. As a little side note, uh, sometimes you'll see LKFS written um, and not LUFS. All that is is just a bunch of geeks arguing over what those units are supposed to be called. But LUFS and LKFS both the same thing. Don't let that confuse you. So loudness can give you a bunch of different readouts, and we're going to actually look at some meters here in a moment, but um, if you're going to mix with one, uh, you want to pay attention to the short-term reading. That reading uses a rolling three-second average, and that works really well when you're mixing, especially when you're mixing the voice. Um, it's not too fast and it's not too slow and it, and it works really well with voice. You can also use momentary um, as well, and that's a bit of a faster one, but um, the reason I'm telling you this is because I'm going to give you a list of free plugins to try, and there's also some plugins uh, and, and some applications here that already incorporate loudness. The spec, the loudness spec, is made to give you a lot of information. And I want you to focus on the short-term number that you get back. And that'll be a good guide, especially if you're mixing uh, public radio type pieces. So I've got an example here from Hindenburg um, that incorporates uh, a loudness meter uh, within it. I'm going to play that same example back, and we're going to see that the 100 hertz tone on the peak meter down there uh, looks exactly the same when it gets to 5K. Now I'm going to go up to the effects rack and I'm going to choose the loudness meter and pay attention to the short term right there. Watch that number. I'm going to play it back again. 100 hertz. And now it slowly ramps up um, and lets us know actually that was a little loud. So cool. <laughs> So the cool thing about this um, is that this meter is actually showing us what we should be hearing, right? The meter is perception-based, and it aligns really nicely with our ears. So let's get into some more real-world examples. Um, so now because we're measuring with loudness, we can focus on how the audio sounds. And since it's showing you what you should hear, it's also great for mixing in less than ideal environments. So, Maybe you're mixing on your laptop uh, in your hotel room and for the second time in a row this week you forgot your headphones. Um, or maybe you are mixing on headphones and you're in a noisy coffee shop. Um, neither of these environments are ideal, obviously, and neither will give you a full picture of the audio. If you were using a loudness meter, um, that would be able to help you keep a consistent level 
from beginning to the end of your piece. Now take that idea and apply it to a show, keeping all of the different pieces in the show aligned with each other. Or break it out to the whole station for a day, or to your, your uh, online stream, or even blow it out and say, let's take the whole system there and get all the shows aligned to each other. Mm. So this is something you can begin using right now, uh, and I want to give you a couple tools to give it a shot. Um, there are some free plugins out there. Um, Tone Boosters has one, and remember, this is being recorded, so you don't have to write this down so quickly. Um, but Tone Boosters is, is a good uh, VST plugin. It's a good, easy to use one. So that's compatible with um, Hindenburg or Audition. The Hoffa 4U meter is also compatible with Pro Tools. Um, and Audition has one as well, and I'm going to skip mm -hmm. to that slide here. Uh, if I open up under the special menu, the loudness radar meter, this one looks a little funny. Um, I'll play back this audio. This is just announcer to the owner. She's setting up an organization to help Ebola victims in Liberia so some good can come from her family's loss. My three daughters were... And obviously that phone is louder and the meter is showing us that, so I can try to get it a little closer here. My three daughters were never... And I'm aiming for 24 right now, and I'll explain that later. My three daughters will never. So it corresponds really nicely. Setting up an organ. Stop that. It corresponds really nicely uh, to the way we hear. Um, there's another way to uh, to go after using loudness as well. So you can use a meter to actively mix, but you can also do normalization. And we're all familiar with peak normalization. Adam explained that earlier. But you can do loudness normalization. So you can say, how loud is uh, mm. clip A? How loud is clip B? How do they sound? Let's forget about the peaks. Let's worry about how they sound. And then adjust them so that they sound as if they were at equal loudness. And let's look at that. And there are two nice ways to do that here in Audition. Sawyer says she's setting up an organization to help people. So again, these in Liberia, two pieces so are not of equal loudness. Her family's loss. Three dollars will never get to know their fathers. I'm going to right click on the one clip and choose match clip volume. And I'm going to leave the settings at default for right now. And I'm going to hit OK. It's now uh, applied about 2 dB of gain. Same thing over here. Leave the settings at default. It's now subtracted some gain from that phoner. And I'm playing back. Sawyer says she's setting up an organization to help Ebola victims in Liberia so some good can come from her family's loss. My three daughters okay. will never get to know their father. So that's pretty close, right? And the peak levels aren't aligning, but the loudness of the two are aligning. There's another way I can do this, and I can actually um, process those files. In other words, permanently change those files. I'm using the Match Volume tab here with the default settings. I'm going to Run, and it's just... Uh, uh, it's actually edited those files on the hard drive, um, and we now have two files that are of equal loudness. That's another way you can go about it. Hindenburg also uh, includes loudness normalization, but in a slightly different, uh, more immediate way, and this is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, if I drag, let's see, if I drag an audio file into Hindenburg, check this out. Whoop! It automatically uh, adjusts that file to meet a predetermined spec. Wow. Now I'll drag in another one here. Bingo. Um, you don't get to, to decide Lawyer what the spec is. She's setting up an organization to help Ebola victims in Liberia so some good can come from nice her family's evil. loss. My three daughters will never get to know their fathers. Okay. Amazing. I'm sorry, Rob. I'm so <laughs> excited. That's amazing. It, it's really nice. It's a really nice feature. And it goes deeper than that. Um, if you were to split up all those clips, uh, you know, you have an hour-long interview and you split it up into little clips, you can loudness normalize each of those little clips. Um, even though it's the same voice from the same interview, you can get them all um, nicely aligned with each other. So this is great, right? We know loudness now is perception-based metering. We know to focus on that short-term metering, uh, regardless of the plugin we use, because they can give you a lot of information. And we also know we can get some free plugs. But once you get to it, what do you do? How do you, what do you mix to? Um, oop, wrong way, there we go. Um, I would suggest mixing to NEG24 LUFS, NEG24 LUFS. I say that because that's really close to the Content Depot spec. 
A lot of us have probably heard neg 15 dbfs thrown around. Um, you know, you ask the question, what do I mix my piece to? What do I mix my spot to? Well, mix it to neg 15 or maybe neg 10 is what you've been told. Neg 24 is a good equivalent of that in the loudness world. So if you can get your voices to hit neg 24 luffs consistently on that short-term meter, um, you'll have enough headroom in your mix and it will match that content depot spec. Um, I'm going to move on here to some other things that aren't loudness related, but I just wanted to remind you, it's not about how the audio looks on a meter in the end. It's really about how it sounds and about what your ear is telling you. So if your ear is telling you that that phoner needs to be just a little quieter or a little louder, but the meter is telling you it's right, regardless of whether it's a peak meter or a loudness meter, go with your ear. Your ear is always right. Okay, moving on. So I wanted to give you some tips, uh, not loudness related stuff, but just some mm -hmm. mixing level related tips. Uh, and I'm going to blow through these pretty quickly. First, find an engineering ally to ask questions of. Find someone who's patient and positive. Um, Jeff Town on the air list is a wonderful example of someone like this. He is readily available to answer questions and I'm often amazed at how quickly uh, he's able to put in so much information into his responses. Um, but you know, find someone in your organization or at least someone in your area who you can bounce uh, ideas and questions off of. Mm -hmm. uh, record in the field to your broadcast spec. You'll be using a peak meter in the field because that's what all of your gear has. That's totally fine, but if you record a broadcast spec in the field, you'll have a little less to do later. Uh, this is a little different, this next bit, than what um, Adam was talking about, um, but I think both approaches mm -hmm. are okay. Rely on volume automation more than you do compression and limiting. That car example that he gave us was a perfect example of this. And it can also be a little more natural um, if you're using volume automation versus compression or limiting. Promise me this, that if you don't know how to do volume automation right now uh, in your audio editing software, learn today before you leave the office. Um, and don't get too tweaky. Um, it's it's mm -hmm. helpful to know, and I actually have to remind myself of this all the time, that you can't really hear a 1 dB difference. The human ear has a hard time hearing uh, the difference of 1 dB. But you can easily hear a 3 dB difference, right? So if you find yourself making little small changes uh, in your Pro Tools layup and you're making a 0.5 change here and a 1 dB change there, maybe sit back for a second, go get a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. come back and ask yourself, can you really hear that difference? Um, you probably want to be making changes more along the lines of 2.5 uh, or a 3 dB and just staying in those larger increments most of the time. Uh, also, don't adjust your monitoring level during mixing. Try to keep it the same while you mix. Um, this helps you maintain a reference from the beginning to the end of your mix session. Even if you're mixing for an hour or two hours long, this can be really helpful for you. And it also helps you keep a reference if you go out to get coffee and you come back. Um, and while you're doing that, mm -hmm. use a master fader to view mm -hmm. the overall level of your mix. If you don't know how to apply a master fader in Pro Tools or in Hindenburg or Audition or whatever you're using, find out today so that you can, you can get an accurate representation of what the overall level of your mix is. Here's a biggie, uh, and if I could get everyone on board with this, I'd be a super happy man. Um, use high-pass filters. Um, high-pass filters are used to eliminate everything below a chosen frequency. Um, so basically, we, we use them a lot to get rid of mud in recordings. Um, this is the biggest mistake I see, I see folks make um, when they're doing uh, mixing, especially for public radio. They add low end. They add low end to make it sound like they're on the radio before they're even on the radio. The FM processing is going to add that low end for you anyway. Mm -hmm. And what we're striving for is intelligibility. If we can get rid of the mud that's down there, that helps to improve intelligibility um, when we're in the car or the dishwasher's going, or we're trying to listen uh, to Morning Edition while we're in the shower, right? Intelligibility is the key. And my laptop just crashed again. Um, I can keep going here, uh, Beck and Audrey, um, if, uh, if you will do the slides for me. Uh, sure. I've got my notes yeah, I'm going to put here really quickly. Sure. Um, Go for it, Rob. Which, which just slide would you like? Good old Evernote. 
Okay, so we're on the high pass slide right now. I'd like you to go to the high pass video slide. It should be the next one. And I'm just going to show you how to add a high pass filter in Pro Tools. Let me know when that's planned. We're playing right now. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to add an insert, and it's the EQ Lawyers insert. Setting up an organization to help I'm going to choose the high it. pass filter. It's the little upside down or the tilted 7 or an L. And I'm going to pick 120 hertz as the frequency. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that is because uh, that's about as high as you want to go with a high pass filter. But that 120 hertz, that's actually the secret of the NPR clean sound. Sawyer says she's setting up an organization. I'm going to play it back a couple times. I can't tell where I am right now. If you're Sawyer listening on a laptop, you probably can't hear a difference, Ebola but that's okay. Sawyer says she's setting up an organization to help Ebola victims in Liberia. Okay, so I'm going to assume it's stopped. Um, so if, if you're on a laptop and that's what you're listening on and you're not on headphones, you probably couldn't hear very much of a difference. But if you were in a car um, and this had been broadcast over FM, you definitely would have heard the low end reduced. Um, and if you've been in the car, like Adam's example showed us earlier, um, the less low end we have, uh, the more intelligible that is. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So the most common mistake, mixing mistake again is to boost low end. Don't. Cut it out. All right. A little full house reference for you. Um, well done. Slide. Uh, so listening. Um, listen back to your mix with the screen turned off. I still do this to this day. Um, whatever it takes to use your ears, right? So either you turn in your chair and you put your back to the monitor or you just reach over and, and turn the monitor off. But listen to that mix with levels and balances in mind without a visual. Um, we get really distracted by that visual. And I'm actually going to renege on an on a, a idea I gave you a little while ago. For your final mix, Double check your final mix by turning the playback volume down about 30%, maybe even 50%. By turning that playback volume down so much, um, you've, in a sense, you're taking the Fletcher Munson out of it, and you're taking the room acoustics out of it, um, and you'll easily hear anything in your mix that drops out too much or that sticks out too much. Um, whenever I'm trying to balance phone or tape to uh, studio voice, um, I find this to be a great trick for making that happen especially if I've compressed that phone or tape. So a few last words of advice for you, and then I'll, I'll uh, get out of your hair here and be done. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, Got it. Ask questions about delivery. So, of course, you're going to ask, what spec would you like for my spot to hit, right? Um, next slide. But take the guesswork out of it. Um, ask really detailed questions. So you've asked me mm -hmm. to have my spot hit neg 15. But as we talked about earlier, that's kind of open to interpretation. So the next mm -hmm. question you ask is, well, what do you, where do you want my voice to sit? Should my voice sit between neg 15 and neg 10, or neg 20 and neg 15? Those are kind of worlds apart um, when, we get into, when we get into editing and mixing this piece. So ask specific questions like that. Um, and you also want to know, what's the absolute hottest I can go with this audio? Um, in Content Depot land, it's neg 3, but your show that you're filing for may actually have a different spec for you, and that's totally okay. And you should ask, if I'm going to get that hot, when should I get that hot? Um, should only music go that hot? Um, mm. can, I, uh, can I go there with just laughter? Um, when should I uh, use up um, all of that space, all of that level? Next slide, please. And also ask, uh, what's going to happen to my audio after I deliver it? Um, is it going to be on a podcast in addition to being broadcast? Uh, are there any automated processes involved? Is there additional mixing? Is someone else going to touch this and work with it? Because all of that can influence um, how you deliver your audio. Um, and there, we can maybe answer some of that in the Q&A a little later, but um, you, you want to know what's going to happen to your audio after you deliver it. So next slide, please. Uh, I want to thank PRX and AIR um, and Adam and Audrey and Rebecca for making this happen. We had a ton of long phone conversations wrapping our heads around this, and I'm really excited that this conversation has gotten started. Um, you can con contact me via this email address here or on Twitter at RobBuyers1. There's been a great conversation started since Adam's piece uh, on Twitter, and I'm really excited to get some of you involved as well. 
And for those of you in public radio world, um, I'll also be at PRPD in September. Please, I'm, I'm, I'm there specifically to talk about loudness. Please send your PDs and your managers my way. I would love to answer their questions. Um, I'm going to be at the APM booth on Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. So I'm going to try to log back in here so we can see some of these questions, but uh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Uh, what we're going to do is 159 right now. So as Rob logs back in, Adam, do you want to select two questions from the uh, question queue and start with those, and then we'll kind of trade back and forth between you and Rob? Sure. Have you guys been monitoring? Are there any consistent themes that are coming up? Uh, with quite a few specific questions. So if there are some that you feel like uh, you have the expertise in, why not grab those? Um, hmm, okay. Uh, the tab of the near the chat box. Ah, I see. So I gotcha. flagged a bunch. So if you scroll up to the top, those will be um, the ones from sort of your presentation. And yeah, we'll yeah. Our way down to Rob. I gotcha. Uh, give me one second. Sure. <laughs> Here's a great question. So everybody seemed to really like that I mix up against some some archival car noise, um, which I, I is one of the like the the is one of my sort of secret weapons. Um, and people are asking me where they can get a good car noise track. Um, drive in a car with your kit and record it. <laughs> um, and I find that uh, you know just sort of town driving isn't super obtrusive. It's really kind of the highway driving. So um, the clip that I use is from going down the interstate. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, everyone is asking, okay, here's one. Um, while things don't clip, you can certainly over compress the audio and make it sound unnatural. Exactly right. So if you're using compression to even out those transients, which again, I want to say that um, in most situations, I really only advocate using compression for transients, not for sort of uh, chunks of audio that have substantial chunks that are wrong relative to each other. So an interview where you get really, really hot and high energy level for the first 10 minutes, and then you start talking about something really sad, and everybody gets really, really quiet. I would not advocate using compression to even out those two sections of that interview. I would advocate uh, doing it the hard way, which is using volume automation and manually going around and adjusting that fader automation level at any given moment in that file. That's going to get you the most natural sound. Again, compression has a sound that sounds sort of commercial. Um, I'm not adverse to it as other people are. Um, I actually kind of like it. Um, I'm, I come from a music background uh, where compression is used for that very effect deliberately, not just to make songs super loud. And everyone knows there's a loudness war in popular music. Everyone wants their track to sound way louder than the next guy's track. That's true. But even if they're not, that's at the mastering stage. In the mixing stage, compression is used all the time for its aesthetic value. It's used to make uh, things like uh, kick drums sound really kind of chunky and meaty uh, bass guitars uh, get lots of compression for the same reason. I like compression. I think it can be used to good aesthetic effect, but just you need to be aware of its aesthetic impact and, uh, and roll with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Adam, let's, uh, I think Rob's back Is Rob back up? Okay, yeah. Yeah, vastly between the two of you. Yeah. So, Rob, can you see that question screen yet, or would you like me just to read you some questions? Uh, I'm not quite there yet. Um, okay. It's loading, so well, go ahead and read. One thing we uh, heard from folks is they would like to hear an explanation of what Content Depot is for those who are non-NPR uh, folks. You bet, you bet. So Content Depot uh, is the mechanism through which we distribute the majority of public radio um, uh, programming uh, here in the U.S. Fantastic. And another one uh, for you, Rob, was to look through the Hindenburg slide again. So we'll, um, we'll pull that up. People were really into that, but they just wanted to see that again and have you explain that once more. Sure. So we'll go back in and pull that slide up real quick. Okay. So um, while you do that, Hindenburg has um, a preference option that allows you to turn on or off auto leveling. And then you can pick a particular 
um, spec, or actually they ask you to pick the country that you're in, um, because Europe and the UK and the US uh, all have different ideas of, of what are appropriate levels, what's an appropriate loudness standard. Um, in Hindenburg, um, you have a US loudness standard. Uh, I just spoke with those folks yesterday. That standard doesn't exactly match the NEG24 um, that, that I've suggested you use but it's still a great start. Um, and it's, it's still very helpful for you if all you need to do is just get a couple of things in line um, or if you want to quick a, mix a quick uh, voice or a quick spot or something. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that again. Um, I, I, have, uh, I have the auto um, uh, limiting, or excuse me, the auto leveling feature turned on here. And once I... We're going to go ahead and play that, Rob, while you're I got you here. here. Okay. I'm, I'm with okay, you. Great. So once I drag a piece of audio in from the desktop, it automatically levels that audio for me. And it's representing that, obviously, by showing the peak Sawyer says she's setting up an organization to help Ebola victims in Liberia so some good can come from her family's loss. My three daughters will never get to know their father. And it's it's really as simple as that. They make that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah. They they make it so easy to use. And if um, this is not a screen share, this is a video, so I'm sorry I can't uh, demonstrate this for you. But if I were to split those different um, segments into more segments, let's say it's an hour long interview, um, I could then for again um, uh, loudness normalize each of those segments. Um, uh, because the, the normalization happens uh, across the entire segment. Um, so if you can see uh, maybe towards the end of that blue one there, it gets a little quieter. So I could actually chunk that off into its own segment, ask Hindenburg, please auto-level that, and it would raise the gain to match everything else. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rob, for going over that again. Uh, and. Adam, we'll go back to you for two sure. more questions. Uh, I might have one that really came up that I think could be helpful for people. Could you go a little bit into compression versus normalization? Okay, sure. Uh, I can reiterate that. Uh, normalization is, uh, all normalization will do is it will take your audio as it is and it will make it as loud as it can go relative to its loudest moment. So if you have a transient, some little blip that's way louder than everything else in the file, then the whole file isn't going to get much louder when you normalize it, because it's just going to get louder relative to that loudest thing. So that's why you need to adjust to the levels internally, either through compression or through fader automation, to basically even it out before you then normalize it to whatever standard you want to normalize it to. Um, here's a really good question from Karen Brown. She says, any advice for fixing audio level discrepancy in a two-way interview in which the two mics were not s properly set? So that would be a situation where maybe um, uh, the host is way louder than the guest or vice versa. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that happens all the time. And that's a situation where I think probably the best way to do it is to do it manually with fader automation. So if you were doing it in Adobe Audition, take your, your file that has the interview in it, drag it into your multi-track session so that your fader automation line will display, and then just grab those lines and manipulate them to make them higher when you need to boost that guest. Now one of the problems with that situation is that the ambient sound of your interview setting will go up along with the interview source, the person who you were trying to make louder. Um, and that can be a really big thing if you're doing interviews in the field um, where say you're you know, interviewing uh, someone by a stream and, uh, and the person that you're talking to is way quieter than you are, uh, you, uh, you boost that person up and all of a sudden the stream, the Bar, 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 the, what do you call it? The bubbling, bar, burbling brook, something, uh, will get louder uh, along with the person, and that can sound really artificial and weird. Uh, or even in a situation where you're doing an interview in a studio, most uh, kind of uh, most studios, because they're not as sophisticated as as the kind of studio you would say, see at APM or at NPR, have some intrinsic noise to them too. My little studio at Georgia Public Broadcasting had some buzz that we could never really track down. Um, there's going to be some ambient sound in any situation that you're in. So this is a great reason why it's always really important to get some clean ambient sound for every 
interview you do. So say we were in the field, we interviewed the naturalist person by that stream, uh, take a second and interview and just record the sound of that stream by itself for a minute. And then what you could then do theoretically is you could use that clean ambient sound to boost the level of the stream under yourself. So we're going back to our example where um, you, the host, are good. Your source who you were interviewing was super quiet. So you boost your source up and now the stream is way louder when the source is talking as opposed to when you're talking. You could then overdub bring in that sound of that stream by itself underneath where you talk to make it louder relative to you and thus totally obscure the distinction between you and your source, if that makes sense. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Rob had a couple that he, um, he picked out, so go ahead with your two, Rob. Sure. Um, so first question from Stephanie here that just came in. If NEG24 loss is ideal for the mix, what should you shoot for for the individual tracks before you do the mix? Um, well, that's really up to you. Um, again, I would say, especially if you're recording in the field or even in the studio, shoot for broadcast spec. Um, so shoot for something that would be close. So if you're forced to use a peak meter in those environments, um, shoot for NEG15. That will probably give you enough headroom. And I, I want to remind folks, I'm coming from uh, the public radio perspective. Um, commercially, there might be some different opinions out there. Um, but NEG15 uh, is a great place because it gives you just enough headroom. Um, so that's a great target to shoot for. Okay, uh, another question here that, uh, or a note that um, mixing for podcast is different than broadcast. Uh, I assume there's less compression limiting the, uh, and EQ in the podcast signal path. That's true. What, what that's referencing is that um, whatever we mix for broadcast is going to go through uh, a lot of processing before it hits that transmitter. And in podcasting, we don't always have that advantage. In podcasting, I put my file out there for the world, and the world downloads my file, and there's nothing between uh, my file and, and the listener, right? So there's no processing happening. Um, so you definitely need to take that into account. Um, I've suggested that we go for NEG24 LUFs. I'm suggesting that based on it being a broadcast spec. Uh, for anyone here who is also a broadcaster and a podcaster, if you're doing the majority of your work at NEG24 and you're mixing and getting, getting everything consistent at NEG24, you can then take that, uh, those mixes and you apply a simple little formula to those uh, to gain them up in preparation for podcast and podcasting. And there's a lot of great information about out, about there um, on how to do exactly that, uh, on what that process should be. Um, where I'm coming from, especially um, talking about the public radio distribution system as a whole, is if we can get the whole system to be consistent for broadcast, then we can make recommendations for the system um, so that they can prep their audio for podcasting, which would be hotter, right? Okay, and then um, the last question here um, was about high pass, and I wrote it down. Um, should you do, should you high pass your audio if uh, you're only destined for the web? If your audio is only destined for the web, I think so. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say that um, is you're, even if you're only a podcaster and you're not doing broadcast or vice versa, you both, both of those scenarios still have to deal with that background noise issue. I listen to podcasts in the car rolling down the interstate, um, and I still have uh, issues with certain podcasts that aren't processed um, uh, uh, hot enough um, or that uh, add a lot of low end to their sound, and it's really kind of hard to hear. It's it's uh, it's uh, makes it a little less intelligible, right? So I I without a doubt I say yes. High pass is still your friend, uh, even when you're podcasting. And just to add to that really quickly, Rob, I, I think that. Um a lot well we know that a lot of people listen to podcasts through headphones more so than radio and a lot of people now have switched over from the old style earbuds to the in-ear headphones that have those little silicone tips on them that form a seal in your ear and that are capable of transmitting much lower frequencies to your ear and i find that in my with my in-ear headphones most of the podcasts i listen to are way too bassy and muddy 
I'd agree with that. So let's, um, we are currently at 2.14, and just in the interest of um, being respectful of your time, Adam, if you want to lead us off, we'll take three questions for, um, for each of you, and then we'll wrap it up, and then after that, you guys can continue the conversation uh, via Twitter or email. So Adam, um, how about your last three? Uh, I am not seeing any unanswered questions unless I'm missing anything. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take one here. Um, Lena says, Lana, sorry, uh, I use H4N and it has a setting for low cut. What hertz should I be using uh, to clip out the mud in the field? Uh, really great question. Um, I would say probably around 80 hertz to begin with. You want to be careful with this and you want to experiment a little bit. 120, a lot of folks will tell you, is um, is getting up there. It's, it's getting a little high, and it can be too severe. Um, in the field, you can, uh, if you use 80, that will help you get rid of a lot of the handling noise problems you might be dealing with. Uh, it will also help with wind, and it'll help a little bit with P-pops too. So 80 hertz is a great place to start. But experiment. You know, it, this all really depends on the make and model of the microphone you're using, um, as well as your recorder. Um, and I, I would suggest doing some test recordings yourself at different settings. Your recorder might have uh, high pass on it, as well as your microphone. And listen to both of those and see what you like a little better. And it's also true that, um, uh, and Rob likes to remind me of this uh, rightly so, that using high and low pass filters can actually help you with with levels issues themselves with transients. Um, some of those, especially in phone tape, uh, those transients, those peaks that you see uh, on the level in your, in your digital audio system um, are actually things that are happening at super, super high or super, super low ends of the frequency spectrum that are just junk. They're just noise. You don't need them anyway. And you can use high and low pass filters to just get out those transients. Uh, someone asked, uh, do you have any audio unit plug-in recommendations? Um, audio units is another type of uh, plug-in, basically. We've got VST and RTAS and AU or audio units, just another kind. Um, I believe uh, the HAFA might be an audio units plug uh, compatible. I'm not sure. But I found these just by Googling for free loudness meter, and there are actually quite a few of them out there. So good luck. Uh, searching for that. And someone, uh, Guy, has asked, if we produce at NEG15, will, will our audio be lower than what is heard through U.S. broadcasts? I'm not exactly sure, uh, I'm not exactly sure that I understand the question. NEG15 uh, dBFS, so NEG15 in the peak world, uh, the world we've all been using up until now, um, that's been the Content Depot standard. So that's what uh, many public radio stations around the country expect to get from the system. Um, so all things considered, is produced pretty close to NEG15, uh, as is Marketplace, right? They're all keeping that spec in mind. And so stations all around the country are um, expecting to receive that signal at NEG15, and they've adjusted all of their equipment um, to expect that as well. And I've actually just gotten confirmation here from my uh, colleague Corey that the Hoffa meter is an AU meter, so you can give that one a shot. Uh, Ryan Noyes here asks, I was always taught to record in the field at minus 6 dB that certain sound artifacts would be lost if recording at a lower gain. Is that hogwash? Could I record at minus 15 dB and be gathering the same sound artifacts as I would at minus 6 on average. Now again, I'm not a trained engineer. Um, Rob may answer this question differently. I'm just going to tell you what I know from my own personal experience, and that is um, re recording levels just don't matter so much now in the digital age. Back in the, uh, the, the, primary, the primary thing that you're worrying about with your recording levels when you're actually out there in the field recording is maximizing your signal to noise ratio without clipping. So you never want to clip, you never want to fry, you never want to destroy it, you never want to go overboard, right? But you always want to have your level set high enough so that you get the loudest possible recording relative to the intrinsic noise of the recording device that you're using. Back in the analog era, when we were recording on tapes, tapes have hiss. They have that sound that they always have. No matter what information they are playing back, they have this intrinsic noise floor that's really loud. So it was really important to always be writing your level to make sure that you were recording 
the best, uh, the highest possible level relative to that noise floor is really important because you can always amplify it after the fact, but you're going to be amplifying the noise floor along with the sound itself. In the digital age, the devices we're using just don't have that much intrinsic noise. They don't. It's not as big of a deal. Um, with kind of lower, uh, uh, with cheaper devices like the Zoom H4n, for example, which I think is kind of notorious for having um, a really, really crappy uh, preamp in it that do have some hiss. Um, there, it can still be an issue. You still want to have the highest possible level. But I tell my students at Mercer University, just when in doubt, be conservative. When in doubt, turn it down. Uh, hiss just, uh, it just isn't as much of a big of a deal in the digital age. Rob, would you agree with me? I, I definitely would agree. Um, and the points you hit about uh, you know, quality of certain devices is definitely true. And this is another reason for going after NEG 15 or something very close to that. Um, especially if you're out in the field recording uh, voices and, and interviews and things like that. That'll give you enough headroom. Um, another question here from John Myers. Is it better to apply the high-pass filter in post-production or use the filter switch on some mics? Uh, wonderful question. Um, and I know that response is every interviewee's uh, favorite response. Wonderful question. But it's true. Um, I would definitely say use the filter on the mic. Here's why I say that. That microphone is passing on uh, all of its signal to the mic pre in your device. So you're out in the field. You're already using maybe an H4n. Uh, and I don't want to pick on that particular device, but it's a good example. Um, that, that shotgun mic you're using uh, picks up your interviewee's P-pop. There's a lot of energy there, and we saw that earlier. There's a lot of energy in that P-pop because there's a lot of low end that mic is going to pass it on through the cable to the mic pre in your H4n. When that P-pop hits the mic pre, it could very well distort at the mic pre. And now you've recorded distortion, right? But if you use that high-pass filter on your microphone, you can prevent that from reaching your mic pre. And you've added a little level of safety uh, to your recording. So again, I highly recommend experimenting a little bit. Um, and if you have the option of using it on your microphone and you think it sounds good, by all means do. Um, one more question here. Uh, this is with uh, Evan. Any guidelines from where podcasts should be ending up in LUFs? So we've been talking about broadcast and <laughs> Destiny Night 24. Um, I know there are a bunch of podcasters here on this list. Interestingly enough, I, I mentioned uh, that iTunes and Spotify are both using loudness processing. Um, they're using it uh, as an option that you can turn on, but they're also using it for their uh, iTunes radio and Spotify radio. And it just so happens that both of those systems, both of those companies, are averaging around NEG 16 LUFS. And by doing that, they've kind of set the standard for the rest of us. Once iTunes Radio got on board and started being so consistent, and then Spotify did too, the rest of us kind of want to match that. So I would suggest somewhere around NEG 16 LUFS, that would be a good place for podcasts to end up. A lot of folks are saying, you know, that's a little too hot. To get there, I have to be a little too compressed. Um, so a lot of folks are ending up around NEG 18 as well, and that's fine. The whole idea is when you switch from iTunes Radio to a podcast in iTunes, to playing something back on Spotify, to a YouTube video, and then to your podcast, you want that to be a consistent experience. And you, you don't want to be the odd man out and having to be the one where folks are adjusting their, their volume level. I, I think probably a good note to end it on maybe, Rob, uh, especially for people who are a little bit overwhelmed by um, all the technical stuff we've talked about, is think about a show that you like. You know, a podcast that you like, that you find doesn't cause problems for your listening level, um, that can come on after whatever you were listening to before it, and you don't have to go and, and screw with your volume knob. Whatever that is, whatever you like, mix your thing to sound like that. Great. I like that advice. Yeah. Um, all right, wonderful. So I know there probably are a few more questions that went unanswered, but we're hoping to preserve those. And hopefully we can keep the conversation going on Twitter, via email, et cetera. Um, awesome. I just want to really thank Rob Byers and Adam Ragusia today for joining us and sharing all of their awesome knowledge. 
Um, and thank you to Beck and to Air for co-hosting the webinar with us. It's really been an exciting conversation. Um, I hope that you guys will all stay in touch because I'm sure there's going to be a lot more conversations about this topic in the coming days, months, etc. Um, there's a lot happening here at PRX and we're hoping to do a lot more webinars just like this one um, in the future. So please do stay in touch on Facebook or at PRX on Twitter. Um, we also have a blog, blog.prx.org, where you can find a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, so please, um, again, and I'll just pass it off to Beth quickly to wrap up. Yeah, I just want to mirror what Audrey was saying. Thank you so much, Adam and Rob. We really worked hard to get this together and um, overcame a couple technical difficulties, and I feel 100% confident in saying this is a smashing success, so thank you for your time. Uh, for those of you listening, if you're not familiar with AIR, please uh, check us out at airmedia.org. And we're on Facebook as well and on Twitter at Air Media. Um, you can also email me at Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, at airmedia.org. So I can't wait to connect. Thank you all so much for participating. Thanks, everyone. See you, everybody. Have a great Have day. Have a great afternoon. Adios. Thank you. Bye.